It's June 14th, E3 2015, the first ever Bethesda Showcase. Today is the day we get our first look at what Todd and the boys have been cooking up in the lab since 2011. After five long years since New Vegas, we finally get a look at the latest Fallout mainline entry, Fallout 4. And by God is it looking good. And so is Todd. This looks like the next gen Fallout game we've been waiting for for so long. The graphics are incredible. The combat looks evolved and truly next generation. And the animations are fluid and detailed. And the... Wait. What the fuck is that? Is that a... Is that a fucking dialogue wheel? Is the... Is the player character talking right now? Is the player character seriously talking like Commander fucking Shepard talking about my favorite store in the Citadel on that bullshit? A fully voiced protagonist? And is that a... Minecraft-ass building mode? I mean, that's cool and all. But I hope the devs weren't taking time off of making meaningful quests and game world content to make this feature. Uh, what are we cooking here, Todd? Todd? These new features represent a trend Bethesda games have been following since the release of Morrowind. A sort of DRPGification of their games from numbers-focused RPGs with derived stats and raw dice roll skill checks to action-adventure games with RPG-like elements. Hell, their latest release Skyrim had almost no skill check mechanics or stat-based skills to speak of, with all the role-playing elements being mostly reserved for how you engage in combat. Such as if you are a fighter, magic user, or a thief or sneak player, and have chosen perks to strengthen your own fighting style. Streamlining these hardcore RPG elements allows you to open the door to a wider audience of gamers to be able to play your game without as much RPG game overhead of learning the systems and mechanics. But the trade-off of this being the alienation of the longtime series fans and enjoyers of the more traditional RPG mechanics, and the loss of the open-ended nature of completing quests. And applying these changes to a Fallout game is an interesting gamble, to say the absolute least. As ever since Interplay dropped the original Fallout in 1997, role-playing was king. It even says on the damn box, a post-nuclear role-playing game. And the dialogue itself was a massive part of the gameplay. Half the actual gameplay of Fallout 1 and 2 is just talking to various NPCs and interacting with and gathering information from them via a slew of dialogue options, which can be locked or unlocked based on what skills you have. Sure, you could still just fight everything you saw and throw hands with your ops all day, but the core gameplay loop was talking to NPCs for information, which oftentimes is the main way you learn about how to approach a situation from different angles, and then you resolve the situation by using the skills your character is best in. And there was almost always several different ways to resolve any given situation the game threw at you. But now, with a voiced player character, who has to be able to speak every single possible line of dialogue, means Bethesda has to spend several additional man hours and money recording pages and pages of voice lines, and many feared that this direction would severely limit the player's dialogue options and by extension, the ability to actually roleplay and be able to tackle any given situation or quest from multiple different angles in the traditional Fallout gameplay loop. And they were absolutely right in these fears. Fallout 4 is undisputedly the most straightforward out of all the Fallout games, being much closer to a Borderlands-esque looter shooter with some light RPG elements than its forefathers. Gone are the numbers-based stats in exchange for a Skyrim-esque perk chart. Although some quests allow you to make some binary choices, or attempt some speech checks to skip quest segments or to get some extra rewards, Fallout 4 mostly builds off of the Skyrim school of game design. Go here, kill all enemies or retrieve X item, pilfer the end dungeon loot chest, repeat. Skill checks are now practically gone outside of some very specific instances, and most quests are resolved in only one way, the only variable being how you engage in the combat based off of your perk selections. Bethesda has given up on building quest scenarios with multiple solutions and role-playing opportunities long ago, and in this game they're much more concerned with you shooting up your safe, fallout familiar ops with their next generation shooter gameplay. Which I will admit, is a massive step up from the Fallout New Vegas slash Fallout 3 mechanics at least. But that's not saying a whole lot, as those game's shooting mechanics were clunkier than an obese robot. <laughs> that's not to say all the mainstay fall design changes are bad, however. I'm actually a pretty big fan of the new weapon and armor crafting systems, along with how power armor is implemented. The weapon crafting system is surprisingly extensive, allowing you to modify weapon sights, barrels, receivers, magazines, stocks, as well as changing weapon ammo types and fire rates. You can change a weapon from a pistol to a rifle just by changing what mods it uses, and the usage of junk items to build said mods is almost downright ingenious. You really do feel like a filthy ass wasteland scavenger stuffing your pockets up with desk fans and 200 year old glue to build a fresh new scope for your weapon, and it adds another layer to world exploration and interaction, which Bethesda still excel at. Power armor is also completely revamped, now being a freestanding suit that you can climb in and out of, and actually feels, you know, powerful. It's no longer just another armor piece that's only unique in the fact that it's locked behind a boolean. And on top of that, there are extensive customizations for the power armor, just like the weapons. You're now a fucking walking tank. But that does come with the trade-off that power armor runs on fusion cores, 
which are fairly rare in the game world, at least in the early slash mid game. The DLCs start passing around fusion cores like candy. And power armor components can take damage and break, which will force you to repair them, further draining your resources. The last and most unprecedented change to Fallout 4 is the building slash settlement systems. This is a wholly new system in the Fallout series, and has been a long requested feature by fans ever since Fallout 3 came out. Screw the prefab house building Bethesda's done in Skyrim with Hearthfire, this system was a new and mostly freeform build whatever you want mode. Minecraft had reached its apex in popularity when Fallout 4 was in development, and I've got to believe that its popularity compelled the devs to add a building slash resource management mode to the game to some extent. You can now build your player home from scratch, and not only that, you can also build facilities and farms for NPCs, and manage their settlements like a true post-nuclear landlord. It's pretty damn ambitious, and I commend the devs for taking a crack at the feature at all. However, unfortunately, I didn't really care for this feature. The game will be like, hey, you want to build up a settlement at fucking uh, Abernathy Farm and run a caravan? <laughs> like, bro, not really. I'd build a small house or base and sanctuary to dump off all my crap and power armor in, and that'd usually be how far I'd get with the crafting portion of the game. The build menu is frankly ass. It's super clunky, slow, and is a mess of menus within menus. Placing down building walls is very janky, and oftentimes the walls won't snap to where you want them to, and will oftentimes snap around to places you aren't even really aiming at. And if you want to build up another settlement, you'll first have to spend lots of time gathering up the resources to build houses, power, and furniture for your settlers, and that is a great way to burn away hours and hours of your life. And it's with these settlements that we can take a look at the first DLCs, Wasteland Workshop, Contraptions Workshop, and Vault Tech Workshop. DLCs number one, Wasteland Workshop, Contraptions Workshop, and Vault Tech Workshop. No, just, just no. I apologize to all the settlement enjoyers out there. If you enjoy the settlement systems in these DLCs, that's great. At least someone was able to get something out of them. But as for me, these DLCs aren't doing anything for me. Wasteland Workshop is just an expansion of the pre-existing building mechanics, adding a lot of new furniture and decoration types with its biggest addition being the ability to trap creatures and build arenas for them to fight in, which is a cool feature in theory, but in practice is only a slightly entertaining side piece of content at best, and seems mostly pointless outside of the novelty of the concept in and of itself. Contraptions Workshop is a bit meatier, adding a lot of new mechanical objects like conveyor belts, logic gates, and other various technical items that can interact with each other to create some tech-esque automated builds, but again, it mostly exists as fluff for the settlement building. Finally, the most unique and justifiable DLC for the workshops is the Vault Tech Workshop, as it adds a slew of vault-themed building objects and is the only one to actually add new content to the game world, as the titular Vault Workshop takes place in the newly added Vault 88, where you the player are able to become overseer of Vault 88 and build up your vault and run experiments on your dwellers after a short and an unengaging questline, which serves as a tutorial for the new vault experiment systems, which are pretty disappointing experiments. Those being a bike experiment? A spiked soda experiment in an eye scanner they called a Faropter experiment. It's definitely the most worthwhile of the workshop DLCs, but outside of the fairly sizable Vault 88 area that contains healthy amounts of rare materials, this DLC again is just fluff for the settlement mode. And if you're like me and didn't care for or don't invest too much time in the settlement portion of the game, you'll be getting jack shit out of these expansions. Ideally, in a perfect world, these settlement and building system expansions would have been in the game since day one as they'd make the settlement system actually pretty dense and worthwhile. But as it stands, you're paying 15 bucks for some frankly unimpressive feature buffs. But I don't want to leave you hanging on the settlement end, and if you aren't too hot on the vanilla settlement systems, I recommend heading on over to the Nexus or whatever mod platform you use and downloading Sim Settlements 2. Sim Settlements 2 completely overhauls how the settlement mechanics work, changing it from a fully manual building grind fest to an actual settlement manager that's dictated by placeable plots. It completely removes the tedious grind for the resources you'd be constantly running out of, and instead leaves all that shit to the computer. And it adds plenty of different plot types to make your settlements feel varied and alive. Not only does it completely revamp the settlement system, it also adds a large, fully voiced questline that unlocks new Sim Settlements 2 features as you play through it. And although I've only played a few hours so far, I can confidently say that this is one of the most impressive mods I've ever played, if not the most impressive. Almost every aspect of it is highly professional and extremely well crafted. From the voice acting, to the quest design, to the actual new building mechanics. And if you're able to download and play it, I highly recommend this mod to cover the settlement portion of Fallout 4, and the Sim Settlement 2 devs just absolutely killed it. It's nothing short of mod greatness. But with that out of the way, let's get into an actual real man's DLC. Automatron. DLC number 2. Automatron. 
Automatron is unique in terms of Fallout DLCs, because up until now, Fallout DLCs had a pretty established precedent. Both Fallout 3 and New Vegas had four expansions each that all added a new map or area, with the only exception being Broken Steel. But even that expansion included pretty big gameplay additions, most notably allowing the player to continue the game after completing the main questline, and adding new world factions and side quests along with an extensive questline of its own. Automatron is the first DLC to really break this tradition. It doesn't add any new worlds, it has a pretty brief questline, and its existence is mostly pinned on its new robot crafting systems. Do these change-ups ruin the DLC? Let's get into it. Automatron starts when the player reaches level 15, which upon reaching that level will unlock the Caravan Distress Frequency Radio Channel that the player can listen in on to start the DLC. The radio signal tells our player that a caravan has been jumped by wild killer robots and gives us the location of where the attack is taking place. Upon arriving at the scene, we fight a pack of the new robot enemies this mod introduces, and I found myself really liking their designs. These aren't the typical robot enemies that we fight throughout the base game. There are these jury-rigged junk bots that have mixed and matched parts. Robo-brain bodies with Mr. Handy jets, Assaultron heads, and mixed arm weapons like blades, lasers, guns, and other mods. There's a ton of possible robot combinations, and I think that the scrapped and jury-rigged designs of them look really good and fit in really well with Fall 4's aesthetics. After destroying these robo-ops, we discovered that we came too late, and all the human members of the caravan have been killed, leaving only their custom bot and main companion of this DLC, Ada, as the sole survivor of the attack. We speak to Ada, and she tells us that her caravan has been getting consistently jumped by these strange robots, and that the robots were being created by someone called the Mechanist. We can pick up the Mechanist holotape from one of the destroyed iBots to learn more about this new villain of the DLC. The Mechanist proclaims themselves as a new hero of the Wasteland, and wants to usher in a quote, Age of Peace with their mishmash robot army, who will fight for and help the people of the Commonwealth until it is free of evil and violence. Plan sounds all fine and dandy, but if that's the case, then why are these robots sliding on peaceful traitors with deadly force? Something isn't adding up here. But for now, we gotta plan our next move. Ada tells us she wants revenge on the Mechanist for killing her friends, and she teams up with us to defeat the Mechanist. Ada tells us that a group of these new bots have been spotted near the General Atomics factory, and we ought to go check it out. We head on over to the factory and fight more robots, and after a quick sweep of the factory, we fight the first boss of this DLC, the Quantum Robobrain, which is the first Robobrain you fight in all of Fallout 4, as Robobrains were added as part of this DLC, and I'll talk more about them a bit later. I blow the dome off of the Robobrain, who for some reason is locked in a caged area at the end of the factory, which requires you to use a terminal to open the maglock door to get into. So if you wanted to fight this quantum Robobrain like a real man, mano a mano, you have to use the terminal to intentionally open the doors to let him out to fight, but you can also just shoot through the fenced walls to kill him while he's still locked up with his legendary enemy robot buddy. I'm not sure if this was intentional or not, but being able to shoot through the cage walls trivializes the fight completely. So I'm not quite sure if the Robobrain was supposed to spawn inside of it or not. But, tangent aside, we loot the robot's body for the Mechanist device to give to Ada. Ada tells us that it is a radar beacon that the Mechanist was using to track the Robobrain, and that Ada can use this beacon to hopefully figure out the Mechanist's location. But we'd have to install it on her with a robot workbench first. Which introduces the biggest addition this DLC contains, the robot companion crafting. Building the robot workbench back at our base unlocks the ability to modify Ada, as well as the ability to create our own robot companion automatrons from scratch. This new building system, like all the other crafting systems in Fallout 4, is surprisingly deep and customizable. Every part of the robot companions is customizable, from the robot's head down to his legs. The robot body parts can be either crafted or picked up from robots you destroy throughout the DLC, which is a really cool concept, taking parts of your slain enemies to build a Frankenstein robot out of their corpses. But in practice, the robots usually only drop one random component at a time, and it will require a ton of looting and robot smashing to actually build a new robot just out of looted pieces. So resources are still much needed for robot creation. And if you want to get the most out of robot building, you'll need to invest heavily in crafting perks like science, robots expert, armor, blacksmith, and gun nut. So you'll need a brain and build like Yakubs to unlock all the possible robot mods. Not only can you combine pretty much any robot part with any other part, you can also modify robot body part armor with multiple tiers of armor and other aesthetic upgrades like skull heads for your bots for extra layers of robot creation. Despite the fairly sizable skill and resource overhead, the robot building is a pretty great feature. It's super modular and lets you make any kind of robot you can think of. Just check out some guys I built like Hunter and Tom here, and I'm only scratching the surface of what you can build with these guys. It's really well done, and I'm impressed with its modularity. After installing the beacon on Ada, she says she can't determine the mechanist's whereabouts yet, but she was able to pick up a signal to another Robobrain that's carrying another beacon, and if we can gather up two more beacons, Ada should be able to triangulate the Mechanist's location. 
So we head off to the location she marked for us on our map and destroy the marked Robobrain and his entourage. Pick up the radar beacon, give it to Ada. Ada tells us that we're getting closer to the mechanist, and that in the meantime, while she works on decrypting the beacon signal, she has one more Robobrain signal for us to check out, which is at the Fort Hagen satellite array, which Ada tells us is occupied by the Rust Devils, a raider gang that are obsessed with robots, using them as attack bots and using their parts as armor, which is a new armor set this DLC introduces, the robot armor. We jog on over to the array and shoot up the Rust Devils and their evil looking robots and penetrate into their base. The Rust Devils, at least design wise, are a cool idea for this DLC. They fight using their own custom robots, which have a much more menacing design than names like the Doom Protectron and the Devil Bots with human skull heads. And their camp is full of hanging and skewered robot corpses and bags of robot scrap that look like the Super Mutant Gore bags. But besides these fun design choices, the Rust Devils don't have much else going for them. We don't know anything about their history or why they're obsessed with robots or what their overarching goals are and why or who they're led by. They, like all other bandit or raider factions in Bethesda games, are very underdeveloped and only really exist to be ops the player can shoot at. Don't expect to be able to join or work alongside the Rust Devils. They're just here to get shot at. Once we reach the end of the Satellite Array dungeon, which to be fair is a decently large and challenging dungeon, we encounter a Robobrain hooked up to a large computer named Jezebel who has been captured by the Rust Devils who tried to use her to find the Mechanist, same as us. Jezebel tells us that along with finding the Mechanist's location, we'd also need to gain access to the facility, which she can help us with if we get her out of the Rust Devils base and build her a new body. So we pick up Jezebel's brain tank, which activates the intimidating robot Ahab from his robot death throne at the back of the room. The Ahab fight is a bit short, but I really enjoyed this fight. He's a custom sentry bot, and his design looks really cool with the sharp jagged metal armor and the skull for a head and he sprays fireballs all across the room, and the effects look really sweet. Using my lore accurate Desert Eagle, we sink Ahab and fight our way out of the array, taking out Ivy and stealing her sweet Tesla power armor and Tesla rifle, a new weapon added by the DLC that shoots electric bolts at enemies. That's alright. Back in my base, I build a new automatron for Jezebel to inhabit, the Tom Brady 1.0 robot. Pleased with her new body and her new status as a systems quarterback, Jezebel reveals to us that the Mechanist had tasked Jezebel and the other robots with finding and helping the people of the Commonwealth. One problem though, Jezebel and the other Robobrains had a different idea for helping people than the Mechanist did. Due to flaws in their logic, the Robobrains determined that the best way to help Commonwealth citizens would be to just straight up kill them, as they're likely to die from other factors anyway resulting in the Mechanist robots terrorizing the Commonwealth citizens. Jezebel also tells us that in order to access the Mechanist layer, we will need to install an MSAT mod on one of our robots. Jezebel then sort of just falls into the background of the DLC, remaining at our base but rendered essentially useless because she's given us the exposition spiel she existed for. So we tell Ada what we learned and install the MSAT, and some new legs, on her, and we learn that the Mechanist layer is hidden within the Robco Sales and Service Center, so we head on over. Once inside, we use the MSAT on the strange device on the wall, which opens up several doors. I've always been a fan of this gag. And we enter the belly of the beast. This final dungeon is actually pretty large and complex, and you can learn some pretty interesting lore about the Robobrains throughout. Terminal entries reveal that the Robobrains were being experimented on as a new step in robotic evolution that would use human brains as a central processor, which would hopefully make the robots more intelligent and more human-like. In order to develop the Robobrains, local criminals were held in captivity in the Robco building and had their brains extracted and placed into Robobrains against their will. However, the scientists were unable to complete their work in fully bridging the brains to their new robot bodies before the bombs fell. And the Robobrains remained functional, but severely logically flawed and prone to violent mishaps. We continue through the mechanist layer, going through a large dumping room, prison facilities, research facilities, and so on until we reach the final chamber, and the mechanist dramatically reveals themselves. Rocking the Mechanist suit from Fallout 3, the Mechanist slanders us as a villain and then six their robot army to attack us in a final battle. We fight off waves of robots in a fairly challenging final arena battle. Most of the difficulty coming from a strong ass dual bot that uses its dick melting face laser and playing on hard means that this attack can melt you in under 2 seconds, so I had to buff up on drugs to take it down. Once that powerful bot is defeated, the Mechanist, getting more and more desperate, starts throwing junk bots at you that die in only a few shots as the auxiliary power continuously goes down. I really like this little touch. It gives the final fight a sense of momentum shifting onto our player, signaling that we are finally close to winning. Once the power finally blows, we confront the Mechanist again, who still condemns us as a villain for killing her robots. So we riz her to come down and talk to us face to face. The Mechanist takes off their helmet to reveal... some lady. We tell her that her robots have been attacking and killing Commonwealth residents, and we aren't actually villains. She tells us that's impossible because she had commanded her robots to protect, and all of her testing with them had been successful. We inform her that the Robobrains were misinterpreting the orders and were saving people by killing them. 
The mechanist finally sees the truth and we tell her to stand down and I let her live. She gives us the mainframe password and we shut down the robot mainframe, completing the automatron quest line. For our troubles, the mechanist, who reveals herself as Isabel Cruz, gives us the mechanist suit as a reward and also opens up the ability to give us radiant quests to hunt down rogue robots for extra parts and rewards. The story of Automatron overall is unfortunately pretty weak. The mechanist not being aware of her robots killing the people she's trying to save doesn't make much sense. Has the mechanist never followed up on what happened to the people the robots saved? Also, her base is full of clues and logs about how unstable and incomplete the RoboBrain's logic is, and based on how smart the mechanist seems to be, I feel like realistically she would have been able to foresee this logical issue with the RoboBrains, or at least follow up on her field tests at all. The same goes for the rest of the characters of this DLC. Jezebel and the Rust Devils, despite having some pretty interesting design and setup, don't really go anywhere interesting. The Rust Devils have no development, lore, or motivation to speak of, and Jezebel, despite seeming to be a plotting, manipulative RoboBrain when we first encounter her, serves to only deliver some exposition and then retreat from the story entirely. Ada is definitely the best character in this DLC, serving as a pretty good companion, but she's also pretty surface level, and her story effectively ends after the mechanist is thwarted. Despite these issues, Automatron is still a surprisingly sturdy DLC. The robot crafting is deep and super modular, and you can lose tons and tons of hours building up, traveling with, and upgrading your robot buddies. The new quests and dungeons are also fairly expansive for the ones that are actually added, and they're actually pretty complex and dangerous and is overall pretty enjoyable to play through. Although the main quest line itself is pretty brief. That coupled with the cool robot designs and the addition of the Robo Brains, Atomadron manages to justify its own existence just enough. But for now, let's move on to the next DLC, Far Harbor. DLC number three, Far Harbor. Far Harbor returns to the established Fallout DLC formula, taking us to a new area known as The Island. Far Harbor isn't the name of the island, it's the name of the town on the island. That's a common misconception, don't get confused. This island is based off of the real-life Mount Desert Island, a small island off the coast of Maine. To access the island, we get a radio message from the Valentine Detective Agency, and when we arrive, we get a case to find a girl, Kasumi Nakano, who had gone missing from her parents' fishing estate. After heading on over to the Nakano residence, which I must say, is a pretty nice house all things considered, these people have a well-kept two-story home and a large bow house. I think they're living better than most pre-war people did. Mr. Nakano must be one hell of a fisherman. We talk to the Nakanos and investigate their house, and through note and holotape hunting, we learned that Kasumi had made contact with a synth settlement via a radio she had fixed up, and she had begun to believe herself to be a synth through contact with them. Eventually convinced that she was indeed a synth, Kasumi took the family boat to Far Harbor to make contact with them. We relayed this info to the Nakanos, and Mr. Nakano offers us his sweet self-driving boat to take us to Far Harbor. So we hop on the boat and sail to Far Harbor, starting the DLC in earnest. Far Harbor starts out very similar to the Fall 3 expansion Point Lookout, arriving at the island via boat as you pass by the gloomy, rocky island. It's dark, oppressive atmosphere setting a strong tone as you slowly pull into the dock of a harbor town. We hop onto the dock and talk to two of the harbor men, Avery and Alan, who are either cautious or just hostile towards our presence. We tell them that we're looking for a girl named Kasumi, and Avery confirms that she had passed through, but there's no time to chat. Monsters are coming out of the old surrounding fog to attack the town. So we join in on the fight, slaughtering some new attacking enemies, the Gulpers, who are large mutated Deathclaw Salamander hybrid creatures, and an Angler, a large land-dwelling Anglerfish beast. This DLC introduces a bunch of new mutated monsters, such as the aforementioned Gulpers and Anglers, but also Fog Crawlers, which are massive mutated shrimp, and my new favorite monster, the Hermit Crabs, which are overgrown Hermit Crabs that use trucks for their shells to hide their massive bodies. And they also added a new gothic, evil-looking Mirelurk variant called the Blood Rage Mirelurk. I really like these new monster types, and besides maybe the Angler, they all fit really well with the Northeastern coastal theme really well. After exterminating the attacking monsters, we talk to Avery to learn more about Far Harbor's predicament. She tells us about the Fog, a misty, bluish, radioactive syphilis cloud that covers the island. It's kind of like its hepatitis cloud cousin from the Sierra Madre. Nobody knows where the cloud originates from, and the cloud is responsible for mutating the local wildlife into the mutated monsters we fight throughout the DLC, and the monsters are lurking all throughout the fog, forcing the harbormen to retreat from inland and fortify themselves in Far Harbor, using those odd-looking pylons called fog condensers to keep the fog from enveloping the town and overrunning them. The harbormen blame the fog spread on the nearby Children of Adam settlement, religious fanatics who worship radiation itself and worship a god fittingly called Adam. By extension of this belief, the children venerate the island's fog as some holy manifestation of Adam, which puts them at odds with the harbormen, who believe the children to be somehow spreading the fog. If this disagreement wasn't enough already, tensions between the children and the harbormen have been ready to blow since Alan had killed the Children of Adam missionary who had gone to their town to try and convert them, and Alan, 
pissed off at the preacher's rhetoric and fueled by his hatred of the children, put a cap in the preacher's ass, killing him. This setup is a pretty good start to Far Harbor. Despite the Harbormen being a fairly generic faction of hardy survivors and slightly xenophobic New England style fishermen, their conflict with the Children of Adam is set up pretty well, and their disagreement over the fog is a serious issue. Moving on, Avery tells us that Kasumi had traveled to the synth-only settlement of Arcadia, which is an old observatory in the middle of the island, and will need a guide to bring us there through the syphilis cloud. This guide is a new companion, Old Longfellow, an old hunter and island guide. He's an okay companion. I really only use him for the first excursion to Arcadia and then leave him be. Longfellow leads us through the fog, fighting some trappers along the way, them being this DLC's Rust Devil's equivalent, that being underdeveloped cannibal raiders with a northeastern fisherman aesthetic to them. They also just exist to get shot at. Don't expect any interesting lore interactions with them. The stroll we take with Longfellow gives us a good overview of Far Harbor. We fight monsters, learn more about the fog, and how in the past it has expanded and retreated seemingly at random, and we encounter a child of Adam cultist that we can learn more about the cult from. Once we reach Arcadia, I leave Longfellow and go pick up Nick Valentine, as he has an important role in this DLC. With Nick in tow, we head inside and talk to the real main character of this DLC, a unique synth named Dima. Dima may be the best written character in all of Fallout 4. He's a mysterious, soft-spoken synth with several bulbs and fuses protruding from his upper back and head. He tells us that Kasumi is here and safe with him, but then Nick butts in, and Dima is shocked to see him. Dima tells Nick that he and him are sort of brothers, them both being prototype synths, with Dima being a synth who was to develop a personality based on his experiences, whereas Nick was a synth who they would attempt to transfer an entire personality onto, and that involved Nick getting his memory wiped constantly after each test. Dima, unable to continue watching Nick lose his identity and feeling a close connection to him, helped Nick escape the Institute alongside himself. Unfortunately for Dima, Nick doesn't remember this event or Dima at all, as his synth processors had long forgotten this event, as it had taken place about a hundred years ago. Regardless, Dima asks us if we think Kasumi is a synth, to which we are unsure of. I'm not sure if Dima knows either, or if he does know and he's just testing our player in Kasumi. But I feel like Dima should be able to know, even if the third generation Siths are grown from biological material rather than built from metal parts. I feel like he should have had some method for detecting the synth parts they still have. But this is just an autistic lore nitpick I have. Dima also questions if we're a synth ourselves, which is an interesting thought experiment, but falls flat because that would be completely impossible unless Sean had hot swapped us with a synth copy of our player character while we were frozen in a Vault 111 cryopod. But that seems... unlikely. Once we're done chatting with Dima, we go talk to Kasumi, who refuses to leave because she's still convinced that she is a synth. But, after Kasumi had done some maintenance work on Dima's systems, she had become suspicious of him, and she believes he may be planning something or hiding some dark secret, as she had found references for the fog engulfing the island and a nuclear detonation in his memory banks. So Kasumi tasks us with figuring out what Dima may be hiding. And this is where Far Harbor makes an unprecedented change. This quest actually has multiple solutions. I can't fucking believe it. Actual RPG gameplay in my Bethesda game. It must be Christmas. Hallelujah. To complete this quest, you can either eavesdrop on Dima and his close advisors, convince him to tell you directly via speech checks, or hack Faraday's terminal using hacking skills. Although it's pretty small, just the fact that you're able to use speech checks to complete quest objectives is an extremely welcome change. It's hard to think that we haven't really had this since New Vegas. And even though I had low charisma and was unable to take advantage of these checks, just the fact that they're here at all is amazing. After failing to get Nick to hack the master lock terminal, and failing to riz Dima into telling us the truth, I get the storage room key and listen in on Dima and his advisor's conversation. From this conversation, we learn that Dima is very concerned about a conflict breaking out between Far Harbor and the Children of Adam. Dima is protective of both of them by building the fog condensers for the harbormen, and giving the children his old home of a nearby submarine base as a place for them to build their religion. We also learn that the children's current leader, a man called High Confessor Tectus, usurped the previous confessor and former friend of Dima's, a man named Martin, who was a much more moderate leader. They fear Tectus may start a conflict with both Arcadia and Far Harbor over his religious zealotry, and they don't trust his judgment. Finally, Dima reveals that some of his memories are stored in the children's sub-base, and he had left them there as a token of his trust with the children. Faraday reveals he has a program that he's been working on that will retrieve Dima's memories, so we snag that holotape and confront Dima about what we heard. Dima agrees to let us go to the sub-base. Since we aren't a part of Arcadia, the children wouldn't see it as an aggressive act from them. So off we go to the sub-base to retrieve his memories. When we arrive at the sub-base, we witness a child of Adam ass-blast another child, and we speak to the doorman, Grand Zealot Richter, who won't let us in unless we perform a ritual, which involves drinking irradiated water from a nasty-ass radioactive spring 
We drink from the spring and start geeking hard almost immediately. A gangrenous filter clouds the screen and a shadowy figure appears before us. We follow the radiation hallucination until we reach an old bunker, unlock the terminal, and pick up a strange wooden figure of a woman. We return to Richter, who is shocked by our discovery of the figure, making him believe that we certainly must have some special purpose. He lets us in to talk with the High Confessor and opens up the Children of Adam quest if that's the path you want to take. But for now, we head on inside. I want to quickly talk about the Children of Adam as a faction. The Children of Adam started in Fallout 3, being a religion started by an old coot named Confessor Cromwell, a disheveled old man who worshipped the undetonated bomb in the center of Megaton. Between Fallout 3 and 4, the religion has seemingly spread quite a bit, being practiced in the Commonwealth and as far north as coastal Maine. The children we encounter the DLC are just one sect of the greater religion, which appears to be wholly decentralized. From a meta standpoint, the cult is pretty great, being a joke religion that expanded way beyond what anyone would have thought, and it becomes strong enough to pose a serious threat on the island. However, in practice I feel like this faction could have been handled better. They're almost too dumb and too meta at times. They worship radiation as a vague concept, and seem to resent ghouls, but I feel like ghouls would be way more venerated by the children, as ghouls who don't go feral can seemingly live indefinitely, and can heal and receive sustenance from just radiation alone. These are real, solid, almost supernatural abilities that I think the cult would make more sense in trying to achieve, as they may see it as power given to them from Adam, but at a cost. Also, although it seems some children of Adam are immune to radiation, many are not, and they must be treated regularly with Rataway and Rad X, or else they'll die from the poisoning. And I feel it could be hard to recruit members into your religion that are actively harmed by the thing you're worshipping. But maybe I'm just wrong about this, and that's just how religion gets some people. But regardless, we move on. We walk in while Tectus is giving a sermon, talking big about spanking the harbormen for their godlessness and hatred of the glorious syphilis fog. We speak with Tectus, who reaffirms his hatred for Far Harbor and gives us access to Dima's memories because of our vision and our potential from our visions of the Mother Deity. After a short fight with the remaining base robots and defenses, and getting my face melted by another Assaultron, we make it into Dima's memories, and we enter one of the most baffling things I've ever seen in a Bethesda game. Probably in any game ever, actually. I genuinely have no idea what they were thinking with this. After interacting with the terminal, you're teleported to this blocky cyber world, and your first task is to clear a path to a large orange cyber pillar with green laser blocks, and clearing the path to the pillar is the main puzzle of this mode. The pillar is accessed by these small green bugs that slowly walk to the pillar and then return to their home pillar to extract Dima's data, but as they return, small spherical drones will attack them, and you have to put down turrets to protect them in a sort of tower defense mode. But the tower defense is piss easy, and the 5 turns you're provided for each level is more than enough defense. This section of the DLC is frankly, ass. It's poop. It's shit from a butt. What, what were, were they, they thinking? thinking? Almost every part of this section is designed to waste time. You have to complete 5 levels of this shit. You have to use the clunky workshop menu to place blocks, and that's your only interaction with the mode. The bugs move slow and their AI is absolutely brain dead. Many times the bugs would just stop in their tracks for extended periods of time. You have to just sit and wait until their AI reactivates and they move forward again. Every puzzle besides the last one is very simple and boring and you're mostly just walking around and waiting. On the final puzzle, I solved it on complete accident as I was trying to get the laser to point it where I needed it to. I'm not sure if I placed it properly or if the game just said, eh fuck it, you've been here long enough, you're good, and let me out. But no matter the reason, I was just glad it was over. This portion of the DLC is just absolute nonsense. And some of my chatters told me they believe this part was added in by Bethesda solely for padding out the main quest. And I'm inclined to agree, as this shit took me 50 minutes to complete. And after you finish the mission, you're pretty much in the Far Harbor endgame, and you'll be empowered to determine the island's fate at this point. From Dima's memories that we extracted, we learned that he had put contingencies in place to destroy either Far Harbor or the Children of Adam if one of them were to act up. These contingencies were the ability to shut off the fog condenser systems that the Harbormen use, which if activated would lead them to be consumed by the fog, and a launch key for the nuclear warhead that's still in the submarine within the children's base. We also learned from Dima's memories that Dima was having trouble with the Harbormen, and in order to pacify them, he had planned to kill and replace one of their citizens with a synth who would moderate tensions and advocate for Arcadia in an unsuspicious manner. We fight through the Vim Pop factory and access a hidden bunker with a buried corpse inside, along with a holotape. Turns out Avery, the first harbor man we talked to, was Dima's planted synth. Dima had killed, buried, and replaced her with a synth, and had removed the memory from his databanks as he couldn't live with his actions. We return to Dima, confront him, again, about his contingencies and his murder of Avery. It's here that we can make a choice on whether to keep his secret or tell Far Harbor the truth, and amazingly, 
This is actually an interesting conundrum to solve. On one hand, Dima was wrong and evil to kill an innocent woman and replace her. But his reasoning is pretty compelling, and from talking with the Harrowman, we see that Avery is the only one who isn't eager to start a massive conflict on the island. She may have been the reason things haven't exploded yet. On the other hand, you can tell Far Harbor the truth, which may be right on the surface, but this will cause them to retaliate violently against Arcadia, which would endanger all of its residents and Kasumi herself, the reason why we're here at all. If your charisma is high enough, you can convince Dima to stand trial in Far Harbor, which either ends up in Dima being killed and the Harrowman assaulting Arcadia, or only Dima being killed, but the player convincing the town to stand down, which you can convince them to do if you've done their quest and gained their trust, making the player's actions throughout the DLC actually meaningful. Finally, if you keep his secret and don't have him stand trial, you'll unlock a third solution, which is a plan to kill and replace Tectus with a more calmed and moderate synth version of himself. You collect some of Martin's old holotapes and Dima will create a doctored recording to scare Tectus into thinking Martin is coming back for his spot as High Confessor. After using your fake news on Tectus, you kill him and have him replaced with a synth, which allows you to complete the main quest without nuking a faction off the map, being the quote, good ending of the questline. The final portion of the main quest is actually amazing in just how much agency you have over the fate of the island. You can destroy all, none, or some of the factions, and there are many options for destroying them. You can even go back to the Commonwealth to alert either the Brotherhood or the Institute to come wipe out Arcadia, or if you want to destroy the Children of Adam, you can get the key and manually destroy their base, or you can convince Tectus to trigger the bomb himself and trigger the division they all want. It's excellent. This is unprecedented for a Bethesda-designed game, and displays a ton of potential for their future games and player choice-centered designs moving forward. I've literally never seen dialogue options matter this much since New Vegas, all the way back in 2011. Once you've either eradicated the faction of your choice, or completed Dima's Tectus replacement plan to ease tensions, the main story of Far Harbor is essentially finished. In my case, I decided to blow the children of Adam to smithereens for having silly beliefs, and doing so actually snags you a reward from Alan, as you just have cooked his dreaded ops for good. Once that's done, we can grab Kasumi, if she's still alive that is, you can get a bad ending with the Nakanos if she's killed in the raid on Arcadia, which is another awesome feature and we bring her home to finish the main questline of Far Harbor. That's not all there is to Far Harbor, as each faction has a healthy supply of side quests to complete, which involve helping build up Far Harbor's defenses, helping this lady resolve some family history, fighting waves of Mirelurks in the Captain's Dance to prove yourself to the Harbormen, fight the adorable Red Death, and so on. There's plenty of faction quests to do, and the rewards are all pretty good, usually either getting a unique weapon or a hefty sum of caps for your efforts, and they'll take you all over the island's interesting locations. There's even a vault murder mystery side quest that may or may not have been stolen from a Fallout 3 mod. But stolen or not, it's still an interesting side quest with a uniquely themed vault and some solid dialogue and storytelling. Overall, Far Harbor is definitely in the top 3 Bethesda DLCs of all time. This may be their best expansion since Shivering Isles. The story is intricate and your choices actually matter, and the amount of agency the devs give you is a promising sign for the future. I really hope Starfield follows and expands on this type of quest design. That coupled with the bevy of sign content in the dense and dangerous island, we have everything we need for a great DLC, and that Far Harbor is. My only issues are the aforementioned bizarre and drawn out memory extraction section, the surprisingly short main quest, and the fairly underdeveloped factions. If the main quest was a bit longer and the factions had a bit more depth, we may have had the GOAT Bethesda DLC on our hands. I'm serious. But for now, let's leave Far Harbor and head on over to the final DLC, Nuka World. DLC number 4. Nuka World. The last DLC release for Fallout 4, Nuka World, takes us to the titular soda-based theme park, which has been overrun with raiders, who have turned one of its five parks into a stronghold. Listening to the Nuka World family radio points us towards the Nuka World Transit Center, where after clearing some gunners and entering, we encounter an injured man named Harvey, who claims raiders have his family held captive in Nuka World, and begs us to rescue them. He's a little suspicious. But there's a plot we have to continue, so we cautiously agree to help and take the tram to Nuka World. As the tram passes by Nuka World, we listen to the automated PA until we receive a transmission from some guy named Porter Gage, who tells us that we've been duped by Harvey's story and are on our way to a death trap, and that he may be able to help us if we survive. After we arrive, we enter a gauntlet that was booby-trapped out the ass by Nuka World Raiders, which was built to entertain the local raider factions. This gauntlet isn't playing around either. It's pretty long. These raiders must have spent thousands and thousands of man hours building this thing. I wonder if these raiders have backgrounds in construction. A union, maybe? This gauntlet is full of explosive traps, plenty of turrets, and my XO-1 power armor I came in on was shredded by the end of it. 
Once we reach the end of the gauntlet, we enter a bumper cars area, where the current Nuka World Overboss, Coulter, is prepping his power armor suit that's connected to the ceiling like a bumper car, which charges his power armor up and makes him practically unkillable. Luckily for us though, Gage tells us that he has prepared a weapon for us to take down Coulter with, a Nuka Cola squirt gun. The squirt gun will cause his electrified armor to fry, leaving Coulter exposed. I actually really like this first section of the DLC. The gauntlet is properly dangerous and longer than you think it would be, setting the tone of this DLC to have some late game combat challenges. And the usage of the squirt gun to take down Coulter is a pretty fun idea, and makes the fight really unique. Setting the silly, off the wall tone having this DLC take place in a theme park lends itself to really well. We squirt on Coulter and then pump his ass full of hot steamy lead until he's a fully cooked product. With Coulter dead, despite us being here for only about 20 minutes, Gage declares us the new overboss of Nuka World, and speaking to him reveals that they were planning on killing Coulter for a while, as they had grown unsatisfied with his rule. Coulter had rallied the three main raider gangs in this expansion under his command, the Pack, the Disciples, and the Operators, and took over Nuka World USA from the traders living there, and made it their new raider kingdom. Dissatisfied with Coulter's lack of will to venture into and capture the four remaining Nuka World parks, as he wanted to sit on his laurels and spend his days killing travelers in his power armor instead. Gage schemed with the other gangs to have Coulter killed and replaced with a more ambitious leader, who conveniently, is us. Gage tells us to come to Fistop Mountain to speak with him to learn more. It's at this point we're finally cut loose into Nuka World, and for now, we'll head towards Fistop Mountain to kick off the DLC's main quest. Along the way, we run into that charlatan Harvey, who coyly tries to apologize to me. I wasn't having it. We also run into Fallout 3's very own Sierra Petrovita, the lady who ran the Nuka-Cola Museum back in the Capital Wasteland, and you could do a quest for her that involves some dude trying to fuck her, remember? Anyway, Sierra is searching for something she doesn't want to tell us about yet, so for now we're tasked with getting her a Nuka-Cola Quartz to gain her trust. After chatting up Sierra, we head over to the Fist Top Grill, where the player's main base in the DLC is located. We speak to Gage, who tells us that we need to reclaim the four remaining Nuka World areas for the Raiders, and to drive out whatever abominations or ops that may be living there. And since Coulter was too busy working on his gauntlet and messing around with his power armor to reclaim the rest of the park, the task now falls to us. But before all of that, we need to go talk to the leaders of the three Nuka World gangs, and unfortunately, these gangs are very weak as actual interesting factions. There's the Pack. A violent survival of the fittest mentality gang that dress colorfully like clowns and love to watch animal fights. Led by their alpha, Mason. There's the Operators, a more classic style mobster gang that dress in robotic suit pieces and put money over all else. Led by Mags Black and her brother. Finally, there's the Disciples, who are overly sadistic and violent and prefer to fight with knives and blades over guns and dress in jagged metallic outfits. They pretty much have the same philosophy as the pack, but are edgier, literally. These factions really fail to impress. What you see is pretty much what you get with these guys, and their bosses just stay cooped up in their respective zones and exist mostly to provide radiant quest objectives to the player. There isn't much at all in terms of development, and you can't really learn more about these gangs beyond the initial introduction, and you can't align or join one gang in particular. They're mostly just window dressing, unfortunately. I think it just may be impossible for Bethesda to write a good raider or evil faction. I think Todd is just too nice. After introducing ourselves to all the gang leaders, we talk with Gage, who tells us it's time to get to work. The remaining zones need to be captured, and when they're cleared out, we must plant a flag and assign a gang to occupy the new area we just cleared. These worlds are Kitty Kingdom, Dry Rock Gulch, Safari Adventure, and the Nuka World Bottling Plant. Exploring and clearing out these worlds is where Nuka World is at its strongest. Bethesda went ham on pulling out all the theme park attractions and tropes. Nuka World takes tons of inspiration from Disney and Hershey Park, having its own Animal Kingdom ripoff, an America-themed entrance park, a Matterhorn clone, a western-style zone that calls back to Disney's Frontierland and Big Thunder Mountain Ride. Nuka-Cola bottle and cap mascots have a strong resemblance to the Hershey Park mascots, along with the sycophantic founder worship of John Caleb Bradburton, the inventor of Nuka-Cola, kind of like how they revere a guy named Walter in real life. There's even a company town called Bradburton. They got literally everything covered here. There's also a Nuka Arcade, which have some simple mini-games, which aren't super compelling, but a nice addition to have nonetheless. From here, Gage is unlocked as a companion and we take control of the parks in any order we want. I first went to Kitty Kingdom, which is overrun with ghouls and sprayers spewing out radioactive green fart gas all throughout the park. As you travel through the kingdom, you're accosted over an intercom by assumedly a ghoul who mocks you and prays hard on your downfall. In order to find this ghoul, we head through a fun house complete with a mirror maze, a spinning tube room, an inverted house, and a room with a spinning floor surrounded by several doors that open to some pretty humorous scenes and extra loot. It's a pretty fun little dungeon. We also search through the maintenance tunnels, and reading logs throughout these buildings reveals what's going on. 
Kitty Kingdom is inhabited by former park employees who took shelter there when the nukes dropped. Through these logs, we learn that the survivors slowly became feral over time, save for a few people. In the theater, we meet the last survivor of the original group, a glowing one ghoul magician named Oswald the Outrageous. He can revive killed ghouls and can also teleport somehow. Hmm. I don't recall this being a known ghoul ability. We defeat him, but he escapes, telling us to meet him on the roof of King Cola's castle. And when we reach the top, I try and fail to convince him to leave, as he is still holding on to hope that his friend Rachel, who had left in search of a cure for the ghoul's ferality, will return with a cure. Failing to convince him, and after a fight where he revives a few times, I pop his head like a water balloon and put him down for good. Later on in my playthrough though, I actually ran into Rachel's corpse in Bradburton, and I found a holotape recording her last moments, where she admits that there isn't a cure to the ferality, and she has decided to kill herself as she slowly became more and more feral. Before she dies, she pleads with Oswald to give up on the cure and to leave the park for good. You can use this holotape to convince Oswald to leave if you find it before you confront him, but the way in which I found it created a uniquely tragic yet wholly organic gameplay moment, and knowing that I killed Oswald makes the moment feel really somber. I think I prefer it that way. Regardless, after killing Oswald, we can now claim the park and assign a raider faction to it. And this feature, like the rest of the raider involved features, is pretty shallow. Assigning a park to a gang won't gain you any extra favors or special rewards with them. The game just spawns a bunch of them in the park that you just captured where they just wander around aimlessly. And the only real reward being a loot chest you can pilfer in the captured park. The main goal of this feature is to determine which gang will turn on you at the end of the main quest. Whichever gang is given the least amount of real estate will turn on you and occupy the power plant of Nuka World, and it's basically nothing more than a running tally to determine who your final opposition will be. Anyway, moving on to Galactic World has us fighting Nuka Cola themed robots and gathering up parts for a large computer control system called Star Control. Star Control is made up of 35 collectible star cores, items that are found all throughout the park. You'll need 20 of them to complete the Galactic World quest, and 35 to unlock the display case in the center of the room that has some sweet quantum-themed power armor. To complete the first part to get the initial 20 star cores, you'll have to visit the Galactic Zone attractions, the Theater, the Robco Battle Zone, Nuka Galaxy, and Vault Tech Among the Stars, all of which have a handful of star cores within them. These attractions are pretty interesting. The Theater is self-explanatory. The Robco Battle Zone has a fun gimmick that involves you getting trapped in the robot battle arena and having to fight for your survival in waves. Nuka Galaxy is the most interesting place of them all, being an indoor roller coaster similar to Space Mountain. That's also a light gun ride, with animatronic aliens and UFOs shooting at you. I don't know if this is how the ride was supposed to be pre-war. If so, these kids would have been getting killed in combat with the real and live laser turrets. And vault Tech Among the Stars is an interesting exhibit from vault Tech that advertises their plans to build vaults on other planets. Also, from this place, I think I can safely call vault Tech the most cartoonishly evil corporation ever, as they couldn't even resist running human experiments in a public attraction, releasing radiation, subliminal audio messaging, and genetically modified flora throughout the facility to test its effects on the minds of visitors and staff. vault Tech's greed for tests is insane, and they really just couldn't help themselves. Despite these interesting locations, our goal here is still to scrounge up star cores, and finding 20 of them was a little tedious. But once we got the required number of star cores, we power up the mainframe and power down the Nuka Cola bots, whose designs I really like. The Mr. Throthy and Nukatrons, especially. They look like walking vending machines, and you can even loot them for their Nuka Cola themed body parts to use on your automatrons. Nice touch. But with Galactic Zone capped, we move on to Dry Rock Gulch. Dry Rock Gulch is a bit more straightforward than the previous two parks, requiring us to wipe out the bloodworms infesting the park. The bloodworms are a new enemy added in this add on. Pink, spiky penis monsters that jump up out of the ground to attack the player. They're certainly yucky looking, but they're also pretty weak, only taking two or three shots from my 10mm pistol to take down most variants of them. Their nest is inside of the Mad Mulligan's Mine Ride, which is currently locked up and can only be opened by playing along with some western themed protectrons that task you with some simple park tasks, like digging a giddy up buttercup out of the trash and dropping it in a pen, delivering Nuka Cola to some thirsty skeletons, and having a duel with one of the protectrons. Once we've got the key to the mine, we take a short walk through the ride, play with some worms and kill the Bloodworm Queen, and then report back to the Protectron Sheriff. And once that's done, the park is ours to claim. It's definitely the weakest park so far. It can be captured pretty quickly after a few small tasks, and the Bloodworms are pretty easy to kill unless you're fighting a legendary variant, but even then it's no big deal. So it's time to move on to the bottling plant. The World of Refreshment Bottling Plant is a bit unique from the other parks, as it doesn't have any story or tasks required outside of killing all the nuka lurks in and around the building, but the plant's design more than makes up for that. 
The World of Refreshment is one of those company glazing rides like the one they got at Hershey Park, where it explains the company history and looks more like a mock factory for their products. The World of Refreshment has a really sweet looking interior with a glowing blue river of Nuka-Cola Quantum, and it's infested with some tough Mirelurk variants called the Nuka-Lurks that have a cool blue glow to them. As you progress through the World of Refreshment, you pass by exhibits of the history of Nuka-Cola, and you can pick up a sweet set of Nuka-Cola themed T-51B power armor by hacking a terminal. Shit looks fire. Once you've massacred every living thing inside of the building, you move back on outside where you take on the nuclear queen boss, and once she and her goons are dead, the plant is yours. That only leaves Safari Adventure. Safari Adventure, this DLC's parody of Animal Kingdom, is currently infested with a horde of gator claws, alligator deathclaw hybrids that were created by an animal cloning device hidden in the park's welcome center. Upon entering the park, we run into a man named Sido, a Tarzan parody character who speaks in primitive caveman speak and was raised by gorillas within the park. He takes us to his gorilla family and explains the predicament the park is in with the gator claws. We team up with him to find the source of the gator claws, and we learn that we need a passcode from one of the former scientists of the Animal Replicator Project to access it. We track down the remains of a Dr. Hine, who we learn was ambushed by animal rights activists and held hostage under the park's roller coaster. Using his password, we get into the cloning area, and from logs from the other scientist, McDermott, we learn that he had become ghoulified after the bombs dropped, and was able to stay alive by using the animal cloning machine as a steady source of food. Bro was eating some real Beyond Meat. Eventually, McDermott got spooked by wasteland scavengers encroaching near the Safari Adventure Park, and began working on an animal hybrid that could defend him and the park, the Gator Claws. Unfortunately for McDermott, however, the technology, like many other technologies in the Fallout series, ran amok. The Gator Claws became too violent and uncontrollable, and they grievously wounded and later killed McDermott, and the cloning machine continually made new Gator Claws until they completely overran the park. But thanks to us, we shut down the replicator and exterminate the remaining Gator Claws in the park. 21, 21 in total. Once the Gator Claws are culled, we can capture the park, but not before we deal with Cedo. Now that we have pacified the park and saved Cedo's home, we tell him that raiders are moving in and he needs to fuck off, which he's surprisingly chill with. He packs his shit up and leaves, and with that, we've conquered all of Nuka World. From here we speak with Gage again, who tells us that it's time to set our sights on the Commonwealth, and to go talk to Shank to begin establishing Raider Settlements, the second portion of this DLC. The Raider Settlements expand on the settlement system even more, allowing you to build evil settlements that are inhabited by Raiders. You set these settlements up by picking a settlement to target, and either shooting up or bribing the current residents to leave, and letting a gang of your choice take over. Once the settlement is captured, you'll then need to convince a nearby settlement to supply your new raider settlement with resources, which is achieved the same way as capturing a settlement. Either beat up or bribe the settlement's leader. Simple as. From there, you can build up your raider settlements and make your little goons happy and resolve issues and conflicts that occur at the raider settlement. It's essentially just a slightly modified normal settlement, but with more options for evil gameplay. In order to quote, finish Nuka World, you need to create three raider settlements, and once that's done, the gang you've given the least amount of real estate to will go all Judas on your ass, and will do a hostile takeover of the power plant, where you'll wipe them and their leader out and turn on the power to Nuka World, unlocking some extra goodies throughout the park and turning on some of the rides. Just one problem with this though. To get to that ending, you need to spend a decent chunk of time building up your raider settlements and making sure they're happy. And whenever I'm tasked with building up settlements and keeping the residents happy, I just get extremely deflated. Like, god damn, bruh, I really gotta build up all these settlements? I don't exactly got all day here. So instead of doing all that bullshit, I just decided to kill all the Nuka World Raiders instead. If you head to the marketplace and speak to Mackenzie Bridgman, one of the former traders who was enslaved by the Raiders, she will tell you about how it could be possible to slaughter all the Nuka World Raiders, which unlocks the quest Open Season. In order to complete this quest and to get the good ending for Nuka World, you have to kill the three leaders of the gangs. So I got busy. Killing all the raider leaders isn't a small task either. Not only are the raiders incredibly spongy, seriously, when they pop a stim pack, they literally heal faster than you can damage them. They're also surrounded by their goons who are all strapped with the DLC exclusive handmade AK-47 rifles that do high damage and have a high fire rate. It's probably the toughest combat in the entire game. It was for me at least, up until that point. But because I'm such a beast of a gamer, I slaughtered all the leaders and slaughtered Gage too as he will turn on you if you begin attacking the gangs, forcing you to put him down, which can be a pretty brutal proposition, especially if you had him follow you throughout the DLC like I did. Sorry I turned you into Swiss cheese, Gage, but it had to be done. But once they're all dead, you return to Mackenzie, who thanks you for releasing her from her chattel slavery, and resolves to keep Nuka World going as a trading post. And... that's about it. 
Besides flipping the power back on if you haven't already, the story of Nuka World just kind of ends at this point. The Raiders are dead, the now freed residents are thankful, but they don't really have much else to say. And although the quest itself is kind of shallow, and actually removes content from the game if you choose that path, but I'm still glad it's available as an option at all, and the fight to get this ending is actually very hardly fought and satisfying to accomplish, even if the resulting narrative is weak and a bit of a letdown. With the main quest complete, I'll cover some Nuka World side content, specifically Sierra's quests in the Hobologists. The Hobologists, which were a Scientology parody from Fallout 2, they even had an NPC parody of Tom Cruise named Juan Cruz. You can even do an auditing of your Thetans to increase your religion level with them have somehow made it all the way from San Francisco to central Massachusetts in search of a spacecraft. You speak to their leader, Dara Hubble, the self-proclaimed descendant of Hubology founder Dick Hubble, who's a parody of L. Ron Hubbard, who invites you to join the Hubologists and tasks you with getting them five spacesuits from the Galactic Zone. After giving them the spacesuits, we travel with them to clear out a junkyard and we reach our goal, an old spinning UFO ride. You know, the ones that make you stick to the wall? They're pretty fun. We repair the UFO and insert fusion cores in it for power, and this quest has a funny little twist to it. When you do this quest, pay attention to the fact that it tells you to only insert three cores, although the component has four empty slots. I put all four in because I didn't want to leave any holes unfilled. But that gave the UFO ride way too much power, and the Hobologists spun so fast their heads exploded. Shit. <laughs> My bad, guys. I really like this result, though. I didn't expect that to happen at all, and it really surprised me when it did. I guess I should have paid more attention. Overall, it's a pretty straightforward quest, but the callback to Fallout 2 and the unexpected ending really gives this quest a ton of charm. The other major side quest involves finding 10 letters from Cappy Art hidden all over the park for Sierra, a clear reference to the hidden Mickey phenomena at Disney. While I like the concept of this quest in theory, in practice there aren't really any clues as to where the Cappies are located specifically, and without a guide of some kind you could easily murder several hours you could have spent making your future brighter and your life better running around a digital theme park looking for hidden Cappies. So I can admit, without shame, that I just looked up a guide to their locations. Otherwise this video would have had to been delayed another month. There's also another reason why I looked up a guide, because the end of this quest is actually super interesting. Once you've found all the cappies and the letters for the passcode to Bradberton's office, the code is refreshing, by the way. Once inside, on his terminal, we learned that old JCB had begun neglecting the failing park systems, like letting Star Control continue to devolve, which caused the robots to go rogue, in favor of focusing on something called Project Cobalt, which would extend Bradberton's life. After finding a hidden button to a secret elevator, and console commanding Sierra to follow me after she got stuck on a vault catwalk, we enter her central chamber to find the frozen and preserved head of John Caleb Braberton. This is a pretty hilarious reference to the popular rumor that Walt Disney was cryogenically frozen after his death in hopes of reviving him in the future, and that his frozen body was being stored somewhere in Disney World. Speaking to the head reveals that Braberton had struck a deal with the US Army to artificially extend his life in exchange for the quantum technology he used to develop Nuka-Cola Quantum with. Braberton was able to get his wish and live on after the war, but as a severed head in a frozen jar, alone in a fancy bunker for 200 years. Braberton asks us to turn off the power and mercy kill him, whereas Sierra wants to keep him alive as she idolizes the man who created her favorite thing on Earth. Killing him gives you access to a unique fat man called the Nuka Nuke Launcher, which launches Nuka Nukes that explode into quantum blue mushroom clouds, whereas Sierra's reward is a Nuka Cola jumpsuit. Sorry Sierra, but cool blue bomb beats out shirt any day of the week. I put Braberton on ice for good and scoop up the Nuka Nuke launcher. Sierra will be upset with you, but in the end you give her the Nuka Cola formula, which cheers her up. Siding with Sierra isn't a bad choice either, narratively speaking, as keeping Braberton alive with his neurotic biggest fan may be a fate worse than death for him, which is pretty funny. It's unfortunate that this quest is locked behind a boring and drawn out scavenger hunt though, as finding Braberton's severed head and solving the subsequent dilemma of whether to kill him or not is some of the most interesting content in the entire expansion. Overall, Nuka World is a bit of a mixed bag. The expansion is just stuffed to the tits with fun and creative theme park ideas and locations to explore, and it was a ton of fun running into all the real-life theme park references and solving each of the park's issues. However, the story is extremely undercooked, and the Raider gangs serve more as decoration than actual factions. And the overall writing of the DLC is pretty weak, outside of a few instances. I also found the Raider settlement systems to be uncompelling, and more of a slight modification of the settlements, rather than a proper expansion. Also, some of the more interesting content and armors are locked behind some drawn-out collectathon quests I just really couldn't be bothered to fully complete. Despite these issues, I found Nuka World itself to be pretty dense and interesting, and the Nuka Cola themed armors, robots, weapons, and wide array of Nuka Cola drinks really do wonders for this expansion's design aesthetics and interactions. 
and the late game combat feels challenging and engaging. And with that, I've gone over all the Fallout 4 DLCs. Now it's time to rank these bastards. Let's get it. In fourth place, we got the Workshop expansions. Again, just, no. Weakest Bethesda DLC since Horse Armor. Get Sim Settlements 2 instead. Simple as. In third, we have Automatron. Very deep and very cool robot crafting system. Cool new robot enemies and decently sized dungeons for the two or three that were added. But the weak story and characters and the lack of substantial actual new content keeps me from putting this anywhere besides the third spot. In second, we have Nuka World. The Nuka World area itself is super dense, creative, and just overflowing with fun theme park ideas from the devs. You can tell they've had ideas for an expansion like this for a long time, and it's a ton of fun. Lots of really fun Nuka Cola themed armors and enemies, and the amount of raw content in this expansion will keep you playing for hours. Weak factions and story really hold back the DLC from achieving its full potential though, and the slight over reliance on uninteresting collectathon quests deflate the gameplay experience a bit. But overall, a very sturdy and an even more creative package. And in first place, we got Fahaba. If this DLC was a little bit longer and had a little bit more depth to the factions, we would have the best Bethesda made DLC on our hands here. The open ended quest design and unprecedented player agency show us what Bethesda could be capable of in the future. Dima is the best character in all of Fallout 4, and the choices you make in this expansion are genuinely interesting and difficult. Supplemented by a large number of side quests for each faction, and the island itself having many large areas to explore, Far Harbor is the complete package, and my pick for the best Fallout 4 DLC. Minus the memory extraction segment though. What the fuck, Todd? And that's just my list. If you have a different opinion or a list, let me know in the comments, and feel free to talk about anything I may have missed as there's probably a few things I probably forgot to mention. Thank you all for watching. It looks like this is going to be another hour-long drop of a video, so I hope you guys like it, and I'll see you very, very soon. Peace. Adios. Goodbye.